I wake up in the morning around 7 and when I get out of my bedroom, I come to sit room, I find the 16 policemen in the bedroom, sitting room. Then, because I was the chairman of the estate, I thought that they wanted to know something about what has happened in the estate. I was completely ignorant of the situation. Then they asked me, are you afraid of God? Is this your house? Yes. Uh, let's go with you to the police station and record a statement and say, over what? Is when they are now revealing to me that it's about my wife. And even how they took me inside the police car was like with the, this fly squad. I was, I was seeing guns being pointed on my face. If I look left, you know, it was like drama to me. You see, the whole community where Abiki came from, they demonized me. They, they saw me, they demonized me as a killer. But when I look at her friendship with Becky on Facebook, I saw she was telling Becky, Becky, you just left a very good husband with kids. I know how you love each other. So she was the one who only was seeing the positive That's side it. of me. Greetings, Tuko family. My name is Lilia Shen. Welcome to yet another episode of Tuko Talks. Um, today, um, I have a very interesting guest because when I did my research and I found out about him, I realized, oh, I've actually seen the story before. And it's, it's not an interesting story, but I feel for him there's a happy ending in as much as there's a lot of things that happened in between that is not interesting for anyone. So I think that's enough for what I have to say. I will give my guest the opportunity to introduce himself and then we can carry on with the story. Karibu sana. Thank you very much, Lily, yeah. for having me here at Tuko. Uh, I know that uh, Tuko also covered this story before. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I would say I'm Professor Fred Ogola. I'm a strategy and governance expert. Uh, people think I'm a politician, but I'm more corporate and more for community development, social issues, civil society, rather than politics. It's just that uh, we have to check the politicians how they are doing. So people think maybe I'm political, but I'm not running any gov I'm not running any political party. Mm -hmm. I'm not in any political party. I'm just a governance strategy expert that is trying to educate Kenyans. Of course, uh, I'm a family man, mm -hmm. like all men say. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have uh, three children. Uh, one of them is called Mattis, the most loved, <laughs> the most loved one. Not for any reason, but because of what we are going through together. Yeah. Then I have another daughter called Leandra. Then I have another daughter called Marin. Uh, they are all lovely children, but uh, Mattis is special because of the special condition that he's gone through. Yeah. I think that's what more or less defines me. And uh, I grew up in a very poor family. My father was a catechist. Um, we lived in Kibera here. He was earning fifteen. Fifteen dollars a month, that's 1,500. With 11 kids, it was difficult to survive. So I look at my family and find that my family members, everybody has succeeded, but in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more academic. I have some of my brothers who are more religious. I have a brother who is a priest. I have a sister who is a bishop. I have a brother who is a teacher, sister who is a teacher. So everybody have a brother also who is a computer science expert called Gerard, very good. He's working for international organization. I'm very proud of him, our last born. So everybody has succeeded on their own. And I discovered there's something that we succeed at childhood. For me, what helps me is that I made some decisions as a very young boy. Uh, and I encourage some people, parents who are parenting outside there, help your children make some decisions early enough to make them mature enough to make difficult decisions when they grow up. Um, uh, why am I saying so? When I was in class seven, my father gave me school fees to another primary school where I was with my brother. We were fighting a lot and discovered I could not succeed there because mm. we were competing too hard. Because see, when you're 11, if you don't show up, you will not go to school. So I took that school fees to another school and I was admitted in a different school from the one my father said. And I kept it secret for around one term. He discovered later. So uh -huh. when he discovered... Yeah, because you see what's happening. When you go to that school, you have uniform of the other school. No, long time ago, you could go to another school with the uniform of another school. Oh, okay. So okay. when you are going, no one knows no where you are going. You come back. and to. Of course, my father was a busy catechist, so he didn't know much. My father knew, but uh, it was the decision I made. So I'm always proud for having made a decision when I was around 11 years old. No, no, around 9 years old. I made a decision. Uh, if you want to know just something about me is that 
I am I always try to be very open and transparent about what I believe in. I I live as I believe my life. Mm. I I I don't just live my life, but if you want to change anything I do, change what I believe in. If you have if you have not given me something greater to believe in, I'll continue living my life the way I live my life. Oh. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Do you have any plans of being in the in politics, deep in it? Not at the moment because I have some things which are more interesting. Oh. Uh, now, if you look at what's happening in our nation here, we've had politics since independence, and uh, you ask yourself, which one has tended to solve our problems more than um, the other? I think being in the private sector, like for example, helping companies, small companies, small, uh, small medium enterprises, helping corporates get right their strategy, getting the right to issue of human resource management, has more impact. Yeah. Um, and then I think now we'll just get right into maybe the reason why I looked for you yes, <laughs> and yes. I said I need to have you seated right here next to me. Yeah. Um, when the story and I read, um, you lost your wife, I think, three years ago, no? Yes. Yeah. And the story around it was a lot. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> it was yes. too much. It was, I even saw you were on news, you were trending, and I said, what? Yeah. For you to even come out and speak about it years later, it's, it's hard. Mm. It's hard to come and try and quote and quote justify what has happened, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we can just start talking about that when you got married. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, um, you see, I went to Europe mm -hmm. to do a degree, PhD, if you like. And uh, when I came back from PhD, first of all, it's important for people to know how I met this woman. Um, I was in Europe, and uh, of course, you see, I was studying and I was still single. I didn't know that I want to marry a Kenyan woman because, see, when you go to Europe, when Kenyans say, ah, yeah. me in Takoja Namzungu. Yeah. In fact, uh, among the Luo community, <laughs> if you bring a woman home who is white skinned, is uh, an achievement to the family. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was happened. But of course, when I went to Europe, when I came back, I met this woman on Digo Street mm. in Mombasa. She was just walking, and I saw her. Then I told my brother, Gerald, that woman is very beautiful. Mm. Can I talk to her? Then he told me, Fred, I know you can. That woman is out of your class. Oh. You, can, you can't access her. Because how she was walking, she was walking majestically. She looked a very focused lady. And also she looked like those, you know, the women who walk on the street were no-nonsense women. That if you really want to approach them, you should really be serious and sure what you want. Yeah. So my brother told me that woman can't even give you a moment. Yeah. And you see, men, for me, have this character. If you challenge me and telling me I can't, that's when I feel I can then I just approached her and we started talking and before he realized, um, I was able to get the number, but it took us two hours of walking. She never wanted to give me any minute. She told me, go away, leave me alone. She was to buy shoes. I told her, can I help you choose shoes? She told me, who, who the hell are you to know how to choose yeah, shoes? I, I told her, I'm a man. <laughs> I will tell how women look like in uh -huh. shoes. So if you only have your friend, which I had a friend who was helping her choose shoes, I told her that actually this woman can be jealous against you to give <laughs> you the wrong. I was just trying to look nice. Yeah. In the end, she gave me the number. But of course, she cheated me. Her name, she told me she was called Stella. Mm. Uh, so she only moved to the new name now when she embraced me and she told me actually I'm called Becky, <laughs> I'm not Stella. That's but uh, the first phone, the first way I saved the number was Stella. Stella. In the end, we were able to discuss. Then I invited her to come and see me off when I was going back to Spain. And then from there, um, I had a girlfriend who was a was coming from Portugal. Actually, she had come with me to to Mumbai. She had come to visit me in Nairobi. We went to Mombasa with her. After letting her fly off, is when I'm meeting this woman. I had to go and write her an email. In fact, people say this is not good of men to do. I don't know what your opinion is, Lily. <laughs> I went on email and told her that I think my heart has gone somewhere. Uh, I'm very open like that. If I like someone, I tell them straight. And if I feel I'm moving on with somebody, I'll tell them straight. I'm sure if there's any ex of mine out there, yeah. they can tell you that I always told them the truth. Sometimes they don't like it, but I just say it. Because it's more painful to waste somebody's 10 years. They'll be crying about their time you wasted there than being painful and tell them it is what it is. Mm -hmm. But also equally, some women have told me that they don't want me. Mm -hmm. So what is the point of trying to sugarcoat things? So. After that, we talked, then we became friends. So we used to do what they call distance dating. Uh, why I'm telling you this story is that the media reported mm -hmm. that I took this man out of poverty and I took her to live in Lovington and I gave her a very high level life 
that I could not take it when she opposed me. And that's maybe how I, have, I must have hurt her. But the truth of the matter is that woman made me. First of all, she was who made me to come back to Kenya. Secondly, she was a woman who never demanded less. She was that woman that if uh, she asked me for a solution and I give her a solution told me, Fred, the way I know you, you can do better than that. Oh, wow. Can you go think of a better solution to this situation? Uh, she used to challenge me to get the best out of me. Even when we were planning our wedding, she told me, Fred, certainly you can do something more like that. Um, when I told her that I want us to wed, um, she told me that, of course, we need to have a good house. So when we went to look for another house, she told me, Fred, actually you can get a better house because we wanted to buy a house in Rongai. And he told me, Fred, looking at how hardworking you are, and me with you, we can actually live in Lovington. Mm. And actually, uh, this Lovington idea was hers. We own a villa in Malindi, where we go for holidays. She's the one who got a coupon from uh, Tuskies, and then we went to the people who are selling the houses. She told me how we can do a financial plan because she was a financial and economist. Most of my successes, what I've achieved, are behind her. I even told people, she even changed my dressing. I used to dress in very different ways now. Maybe if you look at me now dressing in suits, the suits I dress, these are just more or less like she told me, you'd fit well if you dress in this and that way. Your belt shoes like this way. Mm. Because I was a seminary and I was in the seminary, I didn't know too much about yes. how to dress like in a suit and tie. We used to dress in t-shirts and a casual dress mostly. So I would say that the people were pointing out by thinking that I was successful, so I could not take up a woman opposing or maybe talking about me. I would tell you that she defines more my success than anything else. Mm. So uh, that marriage was very a lovely marriage. That's why I am still, well, I mean, I'm married now, but still my wife, I have now currently, she understands so, that yeah. I am moving on slowly. It won't be like I'll just say, forget yeah. about Becky, and now we move the Herima. And I think that is how maybe, that's what the reason that makes me really love my current wife because she understands my situation. Even when she came home when we got married, the pictures of Becky were everywhere, oh. everywhere. And she didn't ask to remove them. She just kept the whole thing until one day I asked her, what do I think about these photos? When she said, okay, by the way, I've been thinking of removing them, but I also know that I have to let you feel like now they can be removed so <laughs> yeah it, there are very few women can understand yeah, this even I, I don't think i would i'd be like no no these pictures need to go down <laughs> yeah but you see now that's the beauty of the story that yeah. uh, she w she is a cousin to my former wife mm. and maybe also they were friends and uh, in fact the whole story about her and becky was that you see the whole community where becky came from they demonized me they, they saw me, they demonized me as a killer. But when I look at her friendship with Becky on Facebook, I saw she was telling Becky, Becky, you just left a very good husband with kids. I know how you love each other. So she was the one who only was seeing the positive yes, side of uh, me. And for her, she was saying from the statements on Facebook, she was saying, I don't think Freddie could have done that to you. Because she was very close to Becky and they were friends. And also she knew how we were relating, but I never met her before. I didn't know her. Oh. I just went, I was now investigating now when I was uh, now thinking of talking to her about this relationship, is when I found out these chats. They were just actually on the wall of Becky and Facebook, how they were chatting. So that's when I discovered that uh, she was very accommodative. In fact, um, truth be said, uh, research shows that if you are a man and you lose your partner, you tend to marry people from the circles of your wife. This really? research shows like 89% like of men tend to marry a woman in the circles of their, their late wife. Because um, the same. It, it's just that uh, that's a good starting point. Oh. You always want to have someone who knows your story. Like, you know, for me, I don't have to sit down and tell my wife, late, current wife, my late wife used to be this, this, and this. I don't need to tell her so much about me because something she knows about me. Uh, so I'm sure that's what happens. But of course, women, I don't know what happens to you, side. I don't know whether you would marry anybody from your inner circle story for another day. <laughs> uh, because also, you know, why this is so is that in a relationship in Africa, it's the man who tend to propose. Mm. So they tend to make decisions around what is comfortable with them. But you know, for you, if you lose your wife, uh, God forbid, or your husband, God forbid, you'll be proposed to by somebody. So your degree of freedom is not as high as that of a man. After she died, it was 
a very short span of death. Imagine someone prepares for you lunch and you eat, and I ate my lunch somewhere around uh, 3, 3.30 there, on 31st of December 20, 2017. The next day, around 10, she's gone. She was okay, she was talking to you, you could, you, she was totally in good faith and then after that she is dead. And then you got uh, the, after another 24 hours you are arrested in a cell, and you are in a cell for 21 days. After eating lunch, <coughs> of course I was supposed to take a certain letter, a parcel that was going to Mombasa. And of course we had some play in the house, you know, normally when you arrive at home, the wife told me, oh, you can't go. Uh, you can't go where you're going at all. I don't have to go. What will you do if I want to go? Then, of course, she pushed me on the bed, isn't it? She pushed me on the bed. Um, and, of course, as a, when a man, a woman pushes on the bed, you fall. Mm. You don't resist because being in the bed, falling on the bed is something romantic. <laughs> uh, then, of course, I was trying to escape from her, isn't it? Mm. Then, of course, uh, uh, she fell and she made some exclamation or some noise. But I was thinking that uh, it was normal. That so, was yeah, me, I ran to send the parcel. So when I was there, then the household called me and told me, do you know what, uh, Becky is still down there. So I rushed back. Oh. So that I said, hey, there's something wrong. You can't play for that long. Mm -hmm. So I rushed back. When we reached Agakan now, she could not talk. She could move her body, but you could, I couldn't talk to her. She couldn't. I tried to call her, she couldn't talk. And that went on and on. She was admitted, tests done. They said that she has got embovilus. Uh, which means a brain clot in the a clot in the brain, and then she has also a clot in the heart. So I was very concerned, but I was told that uh, they're gonna sort it out. So then I called my my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law because now I'm having a baby who is six weeks old in my hands, and I'm also trying to take care of my wife, and I'm one person, mm -hmm. and the household had no idea to do any of the two because she was just six. The the, the child was just six weeks, so. She had never been able to do much with her, with the child. Of course, then they say they are going to come tomorrow. Uh, I'm also, they took it in a low profile. They said going to come tomorrow. I also knew, didn't have anything in my mind that something was going wrong. Mm -hmm. So then the immediate thing, I was now waiting for her at least to recover and breastfeed the baby. Then the doctor comes and tells me, uh, now after five hours that, forget about it, this won't happen. She won't breastfeed the baby now. Start looking for a solution. Mm -hmm. So I had to leave her there. I rushed outside to buy the formula. I ran home, showered Matis, and gave him the formula, put him to bed. After doing that, when I was calling the hospital, I was being told that they are still trying to manage uh, the situation. Then I came back to hospital, and uh, then she had her first heart attack. So then they tried to resuscitate her, and they succeeded after the first child. Then again, I went home to check on the child. Then I came back, the second heart attack, which now was taking place something like, let's say, 3 a.m. in the morning. Then she was stabilized. So they were trying to move her from the high dependency ward to an ICU ward where they could take her to the cath lab to try to do a balloon pump on the heart to move this clot because that was the solution. But I think that it was a mistake of Aga Khan that it was impossible to make this movement without disrupting the support system because she was now under support system. Mm -hmm. And they are trying to find how will they do it to keep the power going as the bed is moving. So in the meantime, she had the second, the third heart attack, which was around 10.30, and that one did not survive. So that was the end of it. So we tried everything. In fact, in fact within those hours between 5.30 p.m. in the evening the, ne the day before and 10 a.m., 10.30 a.m. the next day. Uh, we, we, I approved so many things, tests done, doctors to check. Within that time, a household bill of 850,000 shillings means that we were committing everything possible to see how we can save lives. So when I was hearing people talking about the things they're talking about, you can't even believe that. I said not to listen to them, focus on what is important. Yeah. So the story that, I mean, when you hear a clot, normally you'd say the clot is like you are hit by something. Yeah. So the clot was internal. So the story was that you beat her up? No. She had a CS. The baby was done through cesarean section. But I'm not saying that's the cause because I talked to my doctor and he said that was not the case. But you see these things, the clot was the clot. Yeah. I'm not an expert to say where did it come from. Mm. Uh, some people say it was from the CS. 
uh, why was she having the clot in the head and the heart? But uh, there was history when she had complained of some headache. We went through a serious process. I mean, I got a very big specialist who went through it and was able to help the situation. So there could be hypotheses, but as I said, I don't like insinuations of things which we don't, f we know that it was a clot and the medical report showed the same. Um, but these things of killing was a story that was cooked by the family. Because no, Lily, the process when, when you take someone to hospital after some, let's say physical hurt, mm. the doctors will know. Actually, the doctors will ask for your arrest. Mm. Uh, but the doctors didn't do They even gave me the death. They offered the death notice from the hospital. Because remember, to take her to the mortuary, mm -hmm. the medical doctors had to write a report to be taken to Parkland Police Station that gave a notice to allow you to move the body. Mm -hmm. You can't move the body without that one. In fact, the hospital can't allow you. So Parkland Police Station issued that statement. It's in the OB. Even if you go to 2nd of January, 2nd of February, 2nd of January 2018, you can read it in the Parklands OB book. It's there. Uh, the fact that the issue of that was not a murder case. Mm. The arrest was completely illegal because following the process, there was no warrant of arrest. There was no cause of alarm to warrant an arrest. But you see, it was about how people misuse powers. Becky, Becky's aunt is married to Undanyi, former Undanyi MP. And they had some relative in the diplomatic police. So they used powers. They didn't use the law. Okay. So the they Becky also had two brothers who are policemen. Actually, I'm the one who took one, two of them to Kiganjo. I used my network to help them how they can access. Now, when time came that the very people who are now coming to be, my, to be part of my arrest team, I was arrested by 16 policemen. 16. Yes, and they are the, 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 the Becky's brother whom I took to Kiganjo even went for his graduation and took him from there with my own car means and the rest, was the one who reported. Actually, he was, a, he was the one who did the OB case and the accusations of murder. She's the one who wrote them down. But I'll tell you, what you do, you forgive them. He's come to my house after that. I've never told him this. Maybe Tuko will tell them now. Um, I've never told him that. He came to the house. We have lunch. I've never talked about it. Uh, the family, I've never told them what exactly I feel. Maybe they'll know this through Tuko now. Um, but I forgive them. We hold a very diplomatic relationship with them. Uh, because I love their daughter, I don't have to hate them. I love Becky's mother to date, in spite of what happened. I love that family until today, in spite of what happened, because I love their daughter. She was a good woman. There was nothing questionable about it. So I'm only wondering what happened that they turned against me. But that is them to answer with God. You know, you can't know human's heart. May I only know Becky's heart. She was, she was a good woman. Uh, she, was a good, uh, she was a wife to me, good to me from the beginning to the end. Uh, I know that it has been something she came up from the family because upbringing is key. Mm -hmm. Whatever these people are doing now, it's them to answer, but me, I don't know. People have had theories, like I said, that maybe there was an issue, they thought I had money, so it was about money, because money sometimes changes people's views and perspective, because if they took me to be jailed, and then my son could be taken to stay with them, in legal terms, it was possible to go to court and ask for my resources and assets to take care of the baby, that was possible. Maybe if they're pursuing that, that is them to answer. Me, I only know that uh, the accusations were false. It came from the family. It didn't come from the police. No, there's a, a case whereby the police arrest you after they have been told of what you did. Mm -hmm. This was not someone from outside the family requesting for my arrest. Mm -hmm. It was the family that requested for my arrest. And that's why it was acrimonious. In fact, Becky went through, uh, um, Becky went through four postmortem which was not good. You know, someone cuts your body four times mm. until by the time we're now preparing body for burial, it was even difficult to recognize her. For me, I knew my wife was not there, she was in heaven. I didn't even look at the body to see that she was there because for me, that's not the woman I know. It was very painful even to look at the body in the coffin. I was looking at that body, I was feeling a stranger because she was not the woman I know. Uh, body being cut four times, four post-mortem. First of all, that was destroying the body totally and completely. And mutilating somebody's body because of economic interest was completely evil to me. 
and I didn't think that was nice. And then the other thing which was also interesting in this, in this situation is that uh, money is a bad thing because Johansen Odur, I'm not afraid to say it, who, was the, who is the government pathologist, did very, very unethical things. Because one, when he released the first postmortem result, he used the word but. He said the, the, the postmortem shows that it was a natural death out of the embovilus. Then he said, but Fred must have pushed her to launch a clot. How, how scientific can you be to push somebody? I'm sure so many people could have been killed this way. If I want you dead, um, I know how to push in a way that the, the clot can launch in your lungs and kill you. I'm sure I should be, I should be God. In fact, how can a saintly say that? So that way, they order the second postmortem. And then the second postmortem, the family rejected it. The third one, they rejected. So they did four postmortems. Now, with the four postmortems, what happens is that uh, they were very long because it involved a lot of family rivalries. No, my family was feeling like they know me. They know I can't murder. The other family was saying I've murdered. So, in fact, a whole bus used to come from Voy to, to see this one. To so the post, To witness the postmortem. So it was a long postmortem. So Johansson Odua took each postmortem to be two. So it was two times four. So those ones, he took them as eight postmortem. One postmortem was charged at 50 shillings. So I had to pay that money. 50,000. Yeah, so he t 50,000 times eight. So that's 400,000 shillings. So when I went to take the body of my wife at Montezuma, I found that bill in Montezuma. And I have to, you have to pay to leave. And that was bill paid to him. So a government arrest you for a crime you didn't do. The postmortem is done at your cost. You pay it, results come out that you did nothing. And no one even has said sorry. Mm. You see what I mean? Including the family that was denying. So I'm trying to say the most important thing was forgive and move on. Let human beings be human beings. For me, I like the fact that God was with me in all that process. And here we are. For anyone listening to me, the most important thing is you need in life is mental strength. The mental strength is key because when things hit you, when you are in deepest trouble, mm. I see people tend to emotionally break down and start crying and forget about what somebody, when you are in trouble is when you need your head the most. So what, I, what helped me was that I was really a professor, I'm a decision making expert, and I saw that moment, it was not the time to sit down and start mourning and rest, but to make the crit critical decisions to ensure that I get out of trouble because the trouble was too much. Mm -hmm. The news was porous, everyone, family members, they would watch news, they wake up to headline news of their, their son, your brother, your sister, your, 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 your uncle is, is, a, is a murderer. Uh, you move from being called a professor to be a murderer. That was a very big challenge for me. But uh, uh, the second thing which is important is that we should always rely on God. I know when I say this, people may think this is just spiritual, religious. No. Um, let me tell you, Lily. I've seen people pray, but how we pray, we don't pray the right way. I'm not criticizing people, but most of us don't pray the right way. When you pray, don't pray with conditions to God. <laughs> because some people remove God and Jesus from being the center. Themselves, they should be at the center. And their answers should be their answers. Why are you asking if you have the answers yourself? For me, what I did through that time, I said, God, God, you know me. I put this before you. And my prayer is that you know very well I don't deserve this. But whatever the outcome will be, it is up to you. That's why I had a lot of peace of mind. I could be able to think through the case because I was not thinking about my fate now. I put my fate before God and told God, whatever lesson this should be, let me see how it ends. Maybe. But for now, me, I'll do this my part. Mm -hmm. But now this part is only yours. The areas where you can influence, let God influence them. Secondly, people tend to put their trust a lot in people. For example, in the cell, I saw so many eight lawyers coming to me telling me about solutions. Another lawyer came and told me, give me eight, eight million shillings eight. and leave this case in my hands. Another person told me, these people will take money from your account. Withdraw the money from my account, give me, I got to keep the money for you. There's also a good friend of mine. He even told my brother to, that I should sell my house, sell my property, and then give the family members to enjoy because my fate is gone. 
where, where were you arrested? Because now <coughs> you've said you are at this point in the hospital and everything. At what point did the police come? The 16? Because you said that. You see, after we put the body in Montezuma, yeah. I see that's the time now the family of Becky was arriving. From? From Voy. Um, then, see, we talk, we discuss that the body now is in the Montezuma. We have done our mass. Now we went home, we had dinner. Now I was with my son in the room because I was still taking care of him because I was the only parent and uh, the household was still not mature enough to do that. So I wake up in the morning around 7 and when I get out of my bedroom, I come to sit room, I find the 16 policemen in the bedroom, sitting room. Then because I was the chairman of the estate, I thought that they wanted to know something about what has happened in the estate. I was completely ignorant of the situation. Then they asked me, are you afraid of God? Is this your house? Yes. Uh, let's go with you to the police station and record a statement and say, over what? Is when they're now revealing to me that it's about my wife. So I thought they just wanted a statement to be recorded. When I reached the police station, the stories became different. Uh, I was first of all, I have to talk to DCI. It's not just a normal police case, DCI. And even how they took me inside the police car was like with a, this fly squad. I was, I was seeing guns being pointed on my face. If I look left, you know, it was like drama to me. But of course I was not worried because I'd seen all. My wife was dead. What else am I fearing? In fact, if any case I would go with her, what was the thing to worry? My concern, actually, the only source of strength to stay was my son. Because I said if he loses two parents, then he's completely in trouble. So I stayed there for him. My strength was like, I need to be there so that he has a father uh, because he lost a mother. But the family who was trying to bring my being imprisoned did not consider that there's a, there's a child here that if this child loses a father, the child has lost a mother already. So you cannot bring double tragedy to my son. According to me, even if now they tell, me, tell them, my grandson, my what, I'm trying to say these people were against you. They wanted you to lose both father and mother. Mm. And I know in their heart that they know I didn't do it. I'm telling you. Because they know how we used to relate. I used to drive from here to Voi over Christmas, Easter. We'd stay with the family the whole day. We'd go to the mountains, have photos and videos about it. We'd stay with them in the same home, eat together, play together with them. They saw how we used to relate with Becky. They used to come home, stay, visit, stay for long. So if there was something wrong in this relationship, it could be detectable. So I'm sure in their heart they know that I didn't do it. Uh, I wonder why they have never been said that they knew this. But that's up to them. I'm, me, I'm most concerned about what I know, what I can do, and that's what I focus on. So they're the ones who initiated it. I told you it was not about a legal process. It was about power. We have our person in the diplomatic police. In fact, the current uh, inspector general of police, Jafet Komi, was the police commandant for Nairobi. He called a press conference, in my case, who is Fred Ogola for a, a police commandant to have a live press oh, conference yeah, about? Yeah. It is because of the influence the family had in the police. So it has nothing to do with the legal case because there was no arrest warrant. There was no reason to arrest. It was a suspicion, but the suspicion was recorded by the family. It was not like anybody in government or doctors. In fact, doctors' testimonies, which were sent to the DCI, they went through the doctor's testimony. It was clear from admission. They claimed that Becky died at home. Yet, in hospital, she had got vital signs. Mm. The oxygen level, what level, those things were measured. So is it possible that uh, someone dies at home and they have vitals in the hospital? So it was not possible. Mm. So any story could not work. The other story, they said that Becky died at home and I took her to um, Mpisha and Mpisha refused to take a dead body. Then I bribed Aga Khan who accepted. Now let me ask you, there is a day when uh, one former pres uh, minister died who is called Kaiseri. Mm. President Uru Kenyatta issued a statement that he died in hospital, in the current hospital. The family uh, no, the doctor went and said, no, he didn't die. In car. He died on the way. When he arrived, he had died. If the president can be contradicted by a medical doctor of a hospital, who is Fred Ogola? We are not talking about just a president. We are talking about a prince. Uhuru is not just a president. Uhuru is a son of a former president. 
he's a prince even by then. How can someone with the social capital of Uhuru Kenyatta be contradicted by a hospital, yet for me I can manipulate a hospital? How much money do you need to pay to Aga Khan to manipulate them? And people believe this story. It simply tells you when you hear someone's story there, uh, Lily, being talked against them, don't believe just because the media is saying it. First of all, go and understand what, yes. is it truth? Is it even logical? So, what I'm trying to say is that um, there was no basis at all for this arrest. And uh, the stories were being told could not be believed even by any logically reasonable human being to believe the story that um, this is what happened. And uh, the evidence for that. The other thing which was very powerful also, you see we are deep Christian people and this is not pretense. Eh? Because when Becky was now having this thing of a heart attack, mm -hmm. I went and called the priest who was there in our wedding and I told him Becky is very sick. I want you to come and pray for her. And we believe in what's called the sacrament of anointing of the sick. So he came to anoint Becky in hospital. I didn't know that that was going to help the case in the end because uh, when he anointed Becky, Becky was still alive and she received Holy Communion the, before she died. Mm -hmm. This anointing was done around 7 a.m. in the morning and she dies at 10, 10 30 thereabout. So the priest went to testify and said that Becky was alive and she said, We don't administer Holy Communion to dead people, mm -hmm. we administer to living people. We don't give the sacrament anointing to dead. We give it to the living. Because anointing the sick, you only anoint the sick, not anointing the dead. the dead. So that was also very compelling. So the, the thing is that I told you, God prepared all these scenarios so that liars can come out to be liars. Because I didn't know I was going to be accused to call the pri priest to come anoint. It is just that it was a normal practice to us to bring the priest there. The priest made the prayer. Later the priest became a witness. Uh, uh, also, if I took longer with Becky at home, maybe doing auto, me, I took her also right away and I took her through emergency and vital signs were read. So there was evidence to show that there was nothing I did wrong. In fact, people insinuated on the, on the media that uh, we had a phone fight whereby she wanted to, there's a woman who called me. The, this year I took my phone, printed all messages. In fact, this year told me I'm a very clean man, told me. If you take a man's phone and print messages, what you'll see will amaze you. But he told me, I respect you. Because that this year was the one who slapped me at Kabete police station telling me I was talking to him rudely. When I told him, my brother, you can investigate from A to Z, from the moon to the last planet. You'll not find anything that can take me anywhere. But what you are talking about is thing you hear from the media. And I told him, man. He told me, you know, I'm experienced this year, I can get you. I told him, excuse me, it is not your experience that will take me. It is the evidence that you have mm -hmm. and you don't have. And you can't threaten me. I only fear God. Then he slapped me. I told him, yeah, slap me. But what you can do is that you want to have evidence. In fact, now how evidence will slap me. Slapped, yeah. uh, so later he told me, my brother, I was now understanding after investigation why you are very strong. The and confidence. we are seeing <laughs> the confidence because even your messages, there was no lady who called me that day, fortunately. And uh, another lesson to learn, really, when you wake up in the morning, if we wake up with a bad plan, that may be your last day, you'll be caught. But if you wake up with a clean plan, things you're going to do which are aligned to how things should be done, someone can search for you, they'll never find anything. And I think that's also a learn that every day when you wake up, look, there's something you can plan today and I want to go and sleep in so-and-so's house. That is the day you're going to die. You'll be found dead in somebody's house. So sometimes there are some things we do not knowing that we are not in control of the final outcome of the day. For me, how I arrange my 1st of January, uh, th no, 31st of December 2017, made me get out of it. Because had I planned to go sleep with another woman, that woman could have called, the message could have been found, the conversation could have been evidence, yeah. and therefore the intention, because they said, if you want to kill somebody, there must be intention. What was the intention? They could not find anything. They look at whether we quarrel. They told her the sweetheart. The last message to her was sweetheart. Come quickly, we have din lunch. That's the message she sent me when I was out. I said, sweetheart, just give me a minute. I'm sorting out something. How can you be sweetheart then the next time somebody dies? It was not logical. So um, I believe that um, God was there even within those difficult moments. So how did the burial go? Because at this point now, you've been in cell for 21 days. There's a lot of 
for lack of a better word, hatred between because this is people who are accusing you of murdering someone that you truly and genuinely loved. And then this other side is this is a murderer and he's here coming to, you know, mm. take her child and put her down and to you know to rest. How was that space for you? Well, it was an emotional moment because at some times when even there was some tension in between the families, mm. um, they were in, they were suspicious that we could do something against them. But what we are trying to do is that whenever you have an enemy, don't do something to confirm their doubts or their suspicion. If you suspect that, if they suspect you can actually work something against them, be very good. So for us, we, we, we knew what they were the most hurt people because they were hurt, they lost their daughter. We lost a wife. But also we were in jail. So we had to forgive and accommodate them. Even when they were raising all these concerns, we accommodated them home. We gave them place to sleep. We gave them food. Uh, we offered their transport from Voi to Genya and back to Voi uh, without conditions. We gave them everything they needed. We facilitated everything they wanted. They gave demands. They want a whole bus to go pick them in Voi, take them to Genya. We gave to that demand. Oh um, hey, so we, we, we did everything to show we had goodwill on our side. Yeah. So I'm sure it's a lesson to them that we had no bad intention against them. And it's, uh, if had we acted otherwise, it would have portrayed we are bad people. Uh, maybe God also gave us a chance to understand that we can actually deal with all that. When it came to the time when I was released from the cell, when I was supposed to do burial, do you know people had talked so much on social media that first of all, they were too ashamed to meet me that I'm now out. Secondly, they could see me like somebody who is a killer, that how would they sit to do a, bar a funeral committee to contribute money for the funeral of my wife. So when I left, uh, when I left the cell, I went to Montezuma in the mortuary and I asked for all the bills which were there. And then I asked for how the body can be moved to our home in Siaya. All the costs, and I wrote a single check to them until the body was lowered. It was my money from the bank account. And if I had a bank on a human being, they could have told me now they can't come for meetings. Because after Becky died, some people are coming to start setting up meetings to help the funeral. When they heard it was murder, everybody left me on my own. And I only remain with God and my bank account. So I live my life in this way. I know I have friends, but I'm not banking on them. If they come through, it is God who has sent them, not me. If I use my powers to be nice to them because they'll help me, that's not the way to go. These are my friends, like you are a friend now. But when you need to help me, God will send you to me. Like the person who, the lawyer who helped me, it's a friend of mine whom I've never seen for two years, oh. who came and told me, Fred, I have a good lawyer who can talk to you and help you out on this case. And that is the lawyer who came. She's a lady. Uh, in fact, I've never met her for the last three years when I'm here, because she's very busy. But she came through, helped the case, and moved on. God brought her in my life, sorted out the issue, and move on. But the people hanging too long in your life are just taking time away from you. They can never bring a solution to you. Even me, I look back and say, how, how are you able to be that good? That's but too much. It's yes. gone. Yeah. Too much. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. Mm. Okay. So lastly, I think we'd want to understand. At what point did mm. you, because the other big question was, you've lost your wife and now you're married to the cousin. I mean, that is, would be like, oh. Mm. But of course, yes, you explained that you'd look for someone in your surrounding. Mm. But how did you guys come together to say and sit down and say, I think we can work to be a family? Yeah, first and foremost, um, I didn't know this Becky's cousin before. But of course, I saw her during the burial. Mm. Of course, she's a beautiful woman, so it's not easy to ignore. You know, beautiful women, not, well, women are always easy to see, <laughs> beautiful, you can see. But that I was not concerned because I had no feelings towards women at all. In fact, mm. I knew I would never get married. The love I had, I said I can't be lucky twice. I had all these things, never, 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 never. Um, but you see, there's a time when she came home and she needed to see Mattis. So I gave her the guest room. She stayed there. I was there one night. Then I, I used to travel out because the people taking care of Mattis was my sister and one other house help supporting her. So I was always not there. So she would come, see Mattis. If she knows I'm staying, I don't know what. If she knows I'm staying, she will not stay at home. If I'm leaving, she will spend the night. So she, will st she used to be very friendly to support Mattis. And then, of course, because she was a beautiful woman and she was looking nice all the time. And uh, there's a time I asked her, we go have coffee. 
So I told her that, what, what do you think about us dating? And she told me that's impossible. Yeah, would it's it's impossible same? because our tradition doesn't allow it. She gave me all the reasons why it's impossible. Then uh, for me, the more you say no, <laughs> the, the more it becomes more exciting. <laughs> so I was trying to look for what are the ways and means on which it can be possible. So I came with this compelling theory and I told her, suppose you live your life, and in fact this is a good lesson too, uh, that you re you, there's something uh, that you regret not having done. If there's something that you can live your life knowing, I regret having not done this. The other way also to do something regretting having done it. If you live your life looking at these two ways, will you marry me? She said yes, because maybe you are a nice person. I now know your heart and spirit. I will regret not having such a heart and spirit. Uh, but of course, I would regret um, if I marry you and it's the wrong decision. So I told her, okay, if he, you know that you'd regret not having married me, I didn't consider it. She told me, oh, my family, no. Then after that, we finished the coffee. I took her to her house. I went home. Then we didn't see each other for nearly one year. We never even talked. I even lost her number. Then one day she wanted to get some assistance from immigration office. Then she got my number and called me. And she told me she was moving now from Voi to live in Nairobi. So it's from there again, we had a coffee, then I asked her, why don't we revisit? I'm afraid, totally don't discuss about this issue. I do not want to hear about it. Then I told her, okay, in life there are three values. The first one we call personal values. The second values we have are religious values. The third values we have are what is called uh, traditional values. And I asked her, in order of importance, how would you rank these three values? She told me, personal values first. Yeah. Second, religious values. Third, traditional values. And ask her, in these three values, which ones stops us from getting married? Told me only traditional. traditional. Because my personal values have a conviction, you're a nice person, I would marry you. Two, in t religious values, there's no something opposing it. Of course, they say even choose somebody you know you can live with, blah, blah, blah. But traditional values, they say you cannot marry someone who has married your cousin. Mm. And I said, can you sacrifice your whole life for one value which is least important? And she said no. So that was already a starting point. Then the only thing was waiting to talk to the parents. She told me, talk to my mother. So I made the mother come from Voi to Nairobi. We had lunch, we discussed. The mother said she had no problem because actually the mother is not the one related to the, to the Becky sister, it is the father. So the father to talk. So I went to Voy and I told her, you go to Voy first of all and talk to your father. See his reaction. If it's too harsh, I don't come. If he discover that he had even listened to me, let me come because I cannot be beaten in Voy. <laughs> so she traveled to Voy. She's finished two days. Then she called me and told me. I told my father. Then my father says, why don't you call that man? Come sit here and talk to me. Oh, wow. Then that was a door. When I went, I explained the same values. Eh? The father said, if it is what you guys want, go ahead. Uh, we will leave in a letter for you, go ahead, no traditional whatever arrangement, just go ahead, get married in the church. We can discuss traditional weddings later. And that's how it went through. We did our wedding and now we are going to do our traditional wedding on 4th of May uh, in Voi because at least now the family can take it. Yeah, yeah. Because now we even have two babies, where will these babies go? Now it's no longer about, it's about these two babies. And of course also about our happiness because maybe you cannot infringe on people's happiness just for the sake of traditional values. Oh, and what does Becky's family think? Because, I mean, it's clearly if they're all in void, then they all know this story. No, well, I think that is, they know uh, we are married. They know we live together. They have never told me whether they like it or not. And I don't want to insinuate on what they want to think. And I also don't think it's not relevant because uh, they are no longer a stakeholder in that relationship. But they remain a key stakeholder with my son because mm -hmm. that's their grandson. If they said they want to see him, I can take it. I can take my son to go visit them. Uh, but this other arrangement is normal because, uh, well, you can argue that is Becky's mother still my mother-in-law? No, because the law died. Mm -hmm. Law, you know, your wife is the law. You have the mother-in-law, father-in-law, but the wife is the law. Mm -hmm. So if the law is not there, mm -hmm. so there is no in-law. Uh, but she remains the grand, grand grandmother to my son. Um, and for that matter, she has respect as for that. And if she demands anything about how my son should be brought up, I can have a conversation with her and we can find out to address that. But what, uh, who influences whom I marry, 
I'm sure that's a decision which is very personal. Yeah. And I don't think that uh, their decision matters. But if they have any concerns, if there is, maybe we can discuss about it and see how to manage that concern. Lastly, how's your relationship now, all of you together? Do you still have a relationship with the ex-in-laws? Because now you see, you said there's in the middle, there's this, there's a there's a grandson for them, and there's a yeah, there's the relationship, so is, the relationship is good. Every Christmas, when I'm going, because we usually have for holidays in Malindi, I pass there. We get together, we have lunch, we laugh, they visit. Even the, my sister-in-law came to visit Matis the other day at home. They are friendly and they, they call each other good names. And he calls the Becky's mother, grandmother. My son is also very respectful. I also don't want to, him to live in a way that he has any hatred. I also want him to live in an environment only love. Um, and of course the story is truth be said, he doesn't know that that uh, Herima is not his mother. He knows Herima is his mother fully and totally. He doesn't know he lost a mother. Uh, I, some people have said I should tell him now, but I don't want to tell him. I want him to mature up. If someone tells him out of uh, some goodwill, bad intention, that's up to them, but I'll keep this relationship. Uh, I want to keep this information just like that, that uh, it's not necessary to tell him. But if he grows up and asks me, maybe I would like to tell him when he's ready, like 12, 13. But uh, should he know without uh, proper channels, we can still discuss it. I think he will know. Yeah, but because I'm saying, the yeah. The, the social media and um, this, like this one will go on YouTube. And children these days are too much. Yeah, yeah, but let it, he, let it happen rather than me trying to bring it up. Uh, I'm sure by the time he understands those things, if he can understand what it means to lose a mother and the rest, that conversation now is yes, time to have. Yes, but I don't want to start to be the one trying to prompt it as if uh, his news I can't keep. I'll just keep quiet. I know that the mother loves him, the current mother. The social capital from the mother told the mother that give him a lot of social capital so that even if he discovers you're not the mother, he will discover there was no difference. Mm -hmm. He could have been brought with any woman and he could have turned out the same way. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do because also I have, I have two children who are not... Uh, the children of Becky, and they are not direct sisters to Matis, and I'm trying to treat them equally so that no one feels that I was like this, that's how I got this treatment. I think it's important to do that. Mm. Yeah. And now your current wife is comfortable with everything, even you coming out to share and talking about it, and how, you know, not everyone will know this one was the cousin. This, you know, it's a lot also on her. I know it's a lot on her, but at the same time, it is what it is. I also know she has enough grace to take this. Okay. Um, but also she's been there for me with in these difficult circumstances. And also I'm sure that uh, the, some of these things, the sooner it gets out, the better. So that also she lives with it. In fact, she's lived with it already. I, I would insinuate that there could be some phone calls from the other family mm -hmm. calling them and telling them, I can, but I'm saying I don't know. Uh, at the same time, let's focus on what is important. Uh, somebody needs to learn from this story. God didn't bring this story to us to keep it. Mm -hmm. God bring this story to make someone. If God has given you a gift that you need to share, why are you keeping mm -hmm. it? Even the Bible says, why do you light a candle and put it under the table? So let the candle come out. Whoever will feel this candle is burning them, that is hurting them, after them, but whoever will see light in this candle will have embraced the right part of the candle. So, I mean, you've gone through so much, and I think the way you said the most important lesson I've learned throughout this because it's a lot. Mm. Everybody goes through their own, like, kilam to have something to go through, and you can only, only you can deal with it. Because I don't think if I was there, I think even when someone listens and is a man sitting there, be like, I don't think I'd have gone through this. Mm. The next thing someone would think of is, I need to get out of this life. You know, and you've said depression did not bring you down. There's so much. God gave you so much grace. Honestly, I, I don't know. That's a lot of grace. And even when you talk, when I talked to you on the phone, I didn't think it was this deep. So listening to it and after reading it, it's still a lot. And mm. I mean, I'm actually I'm so sorry for what you went through because that was a lot for you personally, for your family, mm. even for your son coming up. It's gonna be a lot for him. Mm. But I'm glad that you have the strength that you do for him, for you, and for your family now mm. and yeah i just pray god will continue giving you the same grace even more and more and more because mm. you need it <laughs> thank you, you honestly do need it sure. and thank you very much for being a lesson to so many of us here sitting here i may not be a man to go through the same thing but there are a lot of lessons i've learned throughout this whole interview mm. and i appreciate you so much for giving us your time because you are a very busy man <laughs> thank you very much yeah so thank sure. you very much and yes yeah 
Tautuko family that has been such a an interesting story as i said in the beginning and i hope that you've learned so much coming out of this about your faith about your mental space it's very very important and we do advocate for mental space and health very much so this is one of the reasons why we also needed to bring this story out so thank you very much for being us through this whole episode my name is delia and until next time do enjoy the rest of your time bye thank you Thank you.